hopefully it won't only go rain on my side. Um, so we have three um, really interesting talks this evening. Uh, first, what's going to actually play? Uh, and we'll talk about other works, which is developing a easy use environment for the data as well. Um, and then we'll look at splice machines and how they use HBase uh, for transactional IP units. Um, in case of, um, just, just, just in case you're new here or unfamiliar with the logistics, we meet every third Wednesday of the month. So the next one is supposed to be on February 18th. Uh, the videos, the recordings from the talks and the slides are always posted on YouTube by the end theater and then slide share by the end. Just in case um, you did not know, all the previous talks are also posted there. Just in case you want to talk, um, either stand back or go outside so that other side is um, And we're always looking for ideas. Um, if you have any, um, you can reach out to us at the email address at findsweetup at yahoo.com. And the meetup pages has most of the information uh, as we finalize the agenda. If you want to follow us on what we do or publish externally, um, the website's yahoo.tumblr.com, um, and most of what we do um, goes there. I, and it has a lot of history um, from the starting days of Hadoop, uh, as well as the Maker page, um, and all the past Maker that has happened in the last six years. Um, Hadoop Summit's coming up as well, which we co-host with Fortinworks. Um, in case you're interested uh, in Hadoop Summit Brussels, which is happening in April, the early registration for that is closing. Um, and if you um, wish to register, there's a 50% discount set up for members of this group. Um, the code is about 50. Same with the Hadoop Summit San Jose. Uh, the interesting thing is that the call for paper is still open. So it's about one or two weeks from now. Closes on Jan 30th. So if you have abstract ideas, we encourage you to submit them. Um, the same promo code uh, for Hardwood work here as well for early registration. Um, and that ends in February. Okay, so with that, um, I'll invite Costa to talk about Apache Blank, which is a new project. And um, instead of me talking about what it is, I'll hand it over to him. Welcome. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Can people hear me? Can everyone hear me? Yeah? Also in the bottom of the room? Okay. Very nice. Okay. Thank you very much. It's actually very nice. Can you stay on this side? Otherwise, I'll miss you. No, no. Stay there. Don't go on that ah, other side. Okay. <laughs> so, thanks a lot. My name is Kostas. Um, I'm actually here together with Stefan, who's sitting right here. You can, yeah. Um, so we're both committers um, at Apache Flink, uh, which uh, is a new top-level uh, process that the Apache Software Foundation, uh, and it is, uh, it's a data processing engine inside this kind of ecosystem. So it's very nice to actually be in the place where everything kind of again started. Um, so what is Flink? Uh, Flink is a complete data processing stack. It offers programming APIs. Uh, to follow this popular collection-based uh, API style. So if you have programming systems like uh, Spark or Scalding, you would be familiar with distributed collections and transformations of these collections. So Flink offers an API uh, along the same lines. And it offers this kind of API both for analyzing batch data, so batch data sources, and uh, streaming data sources. So uh, both batch and data streaming analysis are done in the same uh, API and actually in the same, in the same engine. Uh, now, what is unique about Flink is that uh, it bugs uh, this API with an execution backend uh, that has some very uh, unique characteristics, and in particular has, uh, has a lot of focus on robustness. Uh, some of these characteristics are here. Uh, I will talk about uh, all of them in more detail. So, one of them is that Flink uh, executes both bus and streaming data analysis uh, using actually data streaming engine. Uh, it, it has a custom memory manager inside that uh, makes it uh, makes sure that the system uh, will not uh, you know die with an upper memory exception. 
uh, has native support for executing iterative programs for the style of, of programs like machine learning or graph processing. Uh, and uh, it actually compiles and packs these collection-based uh, programs uh, using a cost-based optimizer. Um, so why would someone uh, want to use yet another uh, platform for data processing in Hadoop? Uh, in Flink, so for, for Flink in particular, uh, there are a few advantages. Um, the first, uh, of course, is you know, much better performance and ease of use, so very good APIs. Um, and uh, exploiting actually memory pipelining uh, for processing the data. Uh, you can actually unify bus and streaming applications in one API and this are going to execute in the same engine, uh, not using, uh, let's say, sort of micro bus sort of way, but uh, using a, a real time uh, streaming uh, execution. Uh, as I said, uh, a lot of folks on the project has been to building a runtime that, let's say, just works. So to do that, there's a lot of code in the system. Even though the system is written in Java and it runs in the JVM, the, network, the system has its own memory in a very C++ and a B database style. Uh, and what you get in the end out of yeah, a bunch of these fixtures is predictable and dependable execution. So you can see what exactly has been, it's been executed, uh, how it's been executed, and when someone fails, you can trace it back uh, easily. So just to get uh, a very brief idea of, of the API, as I said, it's collection-based programming. Uh, so Flink offers APIs in Java and Scala. Both of them are completely mirrored and offer exactly the same functionality. So the choice of language is just the choice of your favorite language, so that's our Scala. Um, so here we have the, yeah, the basic uh, word count example where we're defining in Scala a case class that calls the words and the frequencies we're defining uh, what in Flink is called an execution environment, an object that uh, allows the system to interact uh, with the outside world. Uh, and using that execution environment, we're reading a text file from HDFS, uh, for example, and applying the flat mode of group by and the sum transformation. So what is, what is also nice is that when you're using, you can use uh, your native Scala classes and you can refer to their fields uh, by name. And all of these goodies are yeah, available both in Scala and, in um, and finally, uh, when we hit this environment with the execute command, this is when actually all the work is going to happen. This is when the system is going to take this program, compile a plan, and send it uh, to the class for execution. Um, so, if you have actually a, data, a streaming data source and not a batch data source, you can do very similar things. So, here we're doing uh, yeah, the same thing, uh, but we're doing it on a never ending. Uh, continuous data stream. To do that, we are getting a stream execution environment, and rather than reading a file from HDFS, we're reading the socket. You can also, you know, read data from Kafka or uh, from your favorite data source. And uh, what we will do is window the stream. Uh, here we're using the window based on counts, so we are keeping 100 uh, elements of the stream, and we are moving this window every 10 elements. And on this window, then we're doing um, our analysis. Uh, these this window definitions are actually very flexible, so you're not restricted to counting elements. You're not restricted to uh, time-based windows. Of course, you can use those. You can define your own. Uh, the system has, has inside uh, implemented time-based and count-based uh, count windows. Uh, but you can be very flexible and basically define what's called a trigger policy or an eviction policy, essentially specifying how large this window is and uh, how often does it move. Um, so, I would actually like to uh, yeah, give you a very, very brief uh, overview of the API and jump uh, into what might be a bit more interesting for Flink is uh, how the system actually executes uh, these collection-based programs, which is uh, a bit unorthodox, um, for at least for the Hadoop world. Uh, so, in general, what you can expect uh, when you're programming Flink is, as I said, reading data from your favorite data sources, both streaming and bats. Uh, the typical functional uh, or SQL-like transformations like map, reduce, uh, join, scope groups, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, what is a little bit unique in Flink is uh, dedicated operators for iterations, so for running programs uh, that make several passes uh, over the data. These are called iterate and iterate delta. Uh, and all of these are available both 
uh, for in the parts context and in the streaming context with slightly different semantics because data streams are like never ending data sources. Uh, for data streams, of course, as I said, you can window them, and the API offers you, you know, besides reading data and transforming data, other, you know, typical things that you want to do, like keeping counters, broadcast variables, and so on and so forth. So, uh, it's a, it has quite a bit of a, quite a rich functionality. Now, the, the way that uh, the system is architected is on the top we have uh, this, these APIs, the top use of Scala and Java API, and on top of these APIs, yeah, people are, are building, let's say, higher level things. Uh, for example, there is a new, uh, let's say, graph API in Flink that gives you a graph data type and you can do uh, transformations to graphs without having to go like to low level of sets of vertices or edges. Um, there's an upcoming Python API, which is actually implemented on Java API, and there are other projects that are compiling higher level uh, DSLs uh, down the flink. All of that stuff is backed uh, by a common API to have a separation of the system internals uh, of the API. Uh, and then there are several ways uh, where this common API is, is actually executed. Uh, so one thing uh, that, uh, that some people like is that you can actually completely bypass Flink if you want, for example, to language with your embedded system, embedded the program in the Java project, uh, and just use Java collections to, uh, to execute it. Uh, the typical thing that you will probably do uh, is that the pro your program is going to pass uh, by an optimizer, uh, use algorithms in what is called the, the Flink local runtime, and then be executed in a cluster. Uh, be that a yarn cluster or a uh, standalone. Um, and uh, another project that is running is actually uh, bypassing the remote environment of Flink, bypassing essentially the network stack of the, of the project and compiling uh, Flink programs using the Flink runtime uh, on top of Apache Test. So one characteristic of the system is that it is very modular, so the, the code is uh, architected in layers and you can plug in and out several components both of the API level and of the pattern level. Um, as I said, uh, the system supports the usual data sources, so uh, every file system that implements uh, HDFS, uh, there's a JDBC driver, HBase, uh, Kafka, Flume, and so on and so forth. And it's actually easy uh, to add uh, more of those. Um, inside, uh, the system uh, contains some very interesting uh, technology. So uh, the, the Flink system actually, although it's a, it's a new uh, top-level Apache project, has a long history coming uh, from academic research uh, in Germany and Europe. Uh, and the technology inside the system is essentially inspired by three fields, by uh, empty databases, distributed systems like MapReduce, uh, and compiler technology. So there are a few components. Uh, so this is basically the, let's say, uh, the life cycle of the program uh, that you write in Flink, you will submit it to the client, uh, we call this a pre-flight stage, where uh, there is going to be actually a compilation and optimization phase, uh, including uh, some type of extraction, and then a plan that will be generated by the system is sent to the, to the master. Uh, the distributed part of the system is architecting the usual uh, master worker pattern, the master being uh, responsible for keeping the metadata, the necessary metadata for recovery, task scheduling, and so on and so forth. Um, the workers themselves uh, have quite a bit of a fat stack that includes, uh, the, so the project has its own, uh, let's say, data serialization stack. It needs that uh, for, for, for keeping the data in serialized form, uh, and that's in the runtime. Uh, it has implementation of, uh, implementations of other core algorithms like uh, yeah, hybrid hash joins, uh, external sorting and so on for processing the data without uh, blowing up memory. Uh, it has uh, its own implementation of a memory manager and a network stack that is based on pipelining or streaming data rather than uh, blocking the bus process. Um, yeah. So, yeah, as I said, the, the way that the system uh, actually executes these collection-based programs uh, is, is fairly unique. Uh, these are four uh, notable features uh, of the Flink runtime. 
Uh, I will probably not have time to go through all of them. I will try to go uh, over the first three of them. Uh, so the first one um, is pipeline data transfers. What I mean by pipeline data transfers is the following. So typically, what, you're, what, what we're used to in, in the batch processing world is when we have a program uh, that takes a data set, makes a transformation, <laughs> creates another intermediate data set, makes a transformation, creates another intermediate data set, is to execute that in stages. So one example here is that we have, let's say, a text file. We're loading it to an intermediate data set. <coughs> we can pass it in partly in memory, partly in disk. Uh, and then we can branch out and do several things with this file. So in this particular example, we are grabbing for three terms and producing uh, three separate data sets. So one way to execute this program is exactly this, this uh, state or blocking uh, execution. Uh, and of course, this is done more. Another way to execute this is to actually stream the data uh, through the operators. This is, this is quite common for, for data streaming systems, think of about a storm or so. Uh, but uh, actually, BATS programs can also be processed uh, in the same way. Uh, now, what is, uh, what is nice about this mode of execution, and uh, what is sometimes unfamiliar to some people, is that uh, when you wrote your program, you actually defined a data set and a variable in your program, you gave it, you gave it a name to represent exactly this intermediate uh, log data set. But in fact, when this program is executed, this, this log data set actually never exists. There's no time in the execution of the program that this thing exists in, in its entirety in the cluster. Uh, yeah. uh, the, the data is just uh, streamed uh, through the operators. Um, so currently, yeah, the default model operation on Flink uh, is pipelining. What you get out of that is that when you have programs that actually create large intermediate data sets or even blow up uh, the base data to create a larger data set. So everything that does not just stream the data uh, after, after you know, a few stages, you can get much better performance because the system does not actually have to materialize uh, this data in the cluster. Uh, and what is also nice is that this, uh, this kind of engine can support both batch processing uh, and uh, real-time uh, stream processing. So the, the engine itself does not uh, stream one record at a time. Uh, it's more optimized for throughput, but uh, when you're doing uh, stream processing, you can actually control that to trade off uh, latency throughput. Um, what the community is working on is actually uh, putting both model operations in the engine, so have both blocking and pipelining. <coughs> and the reason is that in several cases when you have these batch programs, what you actually want to do is create a bunch of these stages and black pipeline within the stages. When you have streaming programs, of course, you want to pipeline, and when you have things like interactive programs uh, that do some computation, bring a result back to the client, go back to the cluster, and so on, uh, you need this blocking. So in the, in the very near future, I think, uh, we can do some of those programs. The second um, nice feature is how the system manages uh, memory. Uh, and the way it does it is that it, it manages its own memory. So it does not rely um, on the yeah, on the on its ADM and uh, on creating Java objects, but uh, it is architected in a way where memory uh, for internal system uses such as caching the real data, sorting caching, um, uh, shuffles, and so on, is allocated uh, at startup uh, when, when the when the job starts. Uh, the, and then the data is actually uh, so so basically the memory is allocated as, as big let's say segments uh, of byte arrays let's say uh, and data is uh, kept not in, in the form of Java objects but uh, in their binary serialized presentation uh, inside uh, these memory segments and all the algorithms inside the system. Uh, work as much as possible directly uh, using these memory segments. Um, in order to do that, uh, as I said, the project has its own uh, type serialization stack uh, and type uh, data serialization stack and type instruction stack. Um, you, there are two nice things uh, that you get out of this. Three nice things. The first is that uh, you don't need to configure the system too much in order to run uh, even very data-intensive workloads. So in fact, uh, the only configuration 
and the fling needs is uh, so the parallelism of every individual job. And for the system as a whole, uh, the total heap size that we get and the percentage of the heap size that will go to the system versus the percentage that will go uh, to the user code, uh, plus another third parameter that is actually in the process of being removed uh, very, very soon. Uh, and that's all. So you can configure more, but you don't need to. So uh, that's all you need to do. Uh, and then the system is guaranteed that it will stay within its memory limits. This dates to disk uh, in a very graceful way, so not like uh, paging, so you're not going to see spikes uh, in performance, uh, and not throwing out of memory uh, exceptionally. Um, so this is, this is one benefit. Uh, another benefit is that you can get very smooth execution, so you do not suffer from this uh, from spikes in execution uh, due to variables collection um, and so on. Uh, yeah. Now, uh, so as I said, uh, memory management, the third pipeline in memory management, the third feature is the way that Flink actually in, uh, executes uh, algorithms that make many parts of the data, aka iterative algorithms. Um, this is an example of an iterative algorithm in, in Flink. Uh, again, we're using the Scala API. You can use the Java API to do exactly the same thing. It's going to look very similar, just the Java and Scala. Uh, and this is finding the transitive closure of the graph. So here we're loading uh, a data set uh, that is, represents the edges of the graph. It has the source and the target vertex. And we are iterating 10 times uh, over uh, a program that repeatedly creates parts of length 2, length 3, length 4, and so on and so forth. Um, so in Flink, I did that here by writing dot iterate and uh, not by using uh, a loop in the, in the host programming language. So iterate is actually a Flink dedicated operator, operator for, for iterations. Um, and what this will do in the runtime is actually create a data flow with the feedback heads uh, that will uh, you know, execute the program once, uh, have the checkpoint, uh, a synchronization point, gather the data, uh, replace the data with what, with what was produced, restart the tasks again and again and again and again. So you can stop iterating either you know, in 10 iterations or you can also define the criteria of stop iterating when uh, something is true. Um, and another way to, to implement, to, to write iterations to clean is using what is called the iterate delta operator. So, um, I probably don't have time to go into details here, but what this gives you is um, the effect of uh, a mutable state uh, inside the system. So you're programming uh, with deltas, and the system internally uh, will merge these deltas uh, in an index rather than following an immutable way of every time replacing the previous solution with the next one. Um, this is a very nice uh, abstraction to implement things like graph processing and a lot of machine learning, in fact, Flink's graph processing library uh, is heavily using uh, this operator. And of course, what you get in the end is the effect of actually doing the work that matters. So in many algorithms uh, that converts uh, asymmetrically, the work that is done at every iteration falls down very, very quickly. There are a few iterations that do a lot, and there's a very long tail of iterations that do very little. And using this iterator operator, you actually explore this effect <coughs> and you get uh, very good performance. So this is, this is a small example of uh, page run and a good map reduce in Flink using immutable normal bulk iterations. So this is 30 iterations and this is 61 iterations. And this is uh, the delta iterations operator. So as you see, uh, the last 30 iterations uh, do a lot of unnecessary work because if you actually exploit uh, the, the delta feature, you can get them down the okay. That's it. So the, the Flink community is, is working on a bunch of things. Um, if you actually uh, want to go to the website and follow the dev list or just see the archives, the community is right now defining a roadmap uh, for the future. A lot of focus is shifting from, so until now the project was very focused on making the engine very robust and fast. Uh, what is happening now is a lot of people are building um, on top of the system. Uh, so there, these are a couple of things that are being worked on. So, uh, machine, learning, some machine learning solutions, uh, graph processing, uh, interactive programs, and integration with, with open source notebook tools, uh, so some SQL front end, and so on. Um, the community of Flink, so even though, as I said, it's a 
it's a young project, it's currently in the growth phase, it's growing very, very fast. So this is uh, yeah, an analysis of key commits, of the unique list of key commits. Uh, so by now there are about 90 people in the project. And that's it. Some sort of statistics that is true. It does um, the in performance for Flink. They have a functionality that allows you to, to draw some lightweight samples and work with those. Um, so the less in databases, the, the further you move up the operator tree, the less reliable those samples get. And um, that, that is something that where where the cost base optimizer has to fall back to some default estimates. The way we do this, it works a little different um, than in databases. So it falls back to to, to very robust strategies to the, to the most scalable strategy usually. Um, what, what we're doing about this is, um, is, I'm not sure if you picked it up, it was just a, a minor point on one of the slides, is that we're adding more interactive features to the system and we're actually changing the optimizer also to sort of interactively um, work with the system. So it's actually deploying parts of the plan one after another and taking knowledge about intermediate results into account for later stages. Thank you. So, did you do any for the streaming part? Uh, for the streaming part? Yeah. Okay. For the streaming part, did you do any comparison to a Spark Stream or Storm with uh, MIDI batches? Yeah, we did. Um, I don't have the charts uh, right now. So, um, <coughs> yeah. um, so it's uh, the performance is um, is quite good. So, streaming is actually a very new addition to Flink. It's, uh, it's under rapid development, so until now uh, it has uh, it has much higher through the storm, the storm uh, and it compares yeah actually very very well uh, compared to Spark uh, So how many messages per second? That depends on I mean how large your degree yeah. of parallel is. So you haven't done any of the benchmarks that exist on we, we haven't no. So we let, let us actually get back to you on that one because I know that a bunch of people are working on streaming or preparing a blog post and some new uh, experiments. And, uh, we'll, we'll have a very soon. Yeah, and then also some numbers. Um, the numbers also depend on you have you have knobs that trade off latency versus throughput in, in Flink, right? So whenever a task produces um, <coughs> produces messages, they they are buffered, and you can um, you can for example define upper latencies, how long they are buffered before they get flushed. When you turn this knob more, more towards latency, then slower messages get flushed faster. It, it hits the throughput, but it, it brings the latency down. If you want, if you want more throughput, then you just need to run one of the benchmarks. And yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a Very basic question: How do you define windows? Mm -hmm. uh, what's the size that you can work with? Mm -hmm. And what if you can't work with the size? And uh, second question: On your memory slide that you showed, you showed sort and shuffle and those kinds of things. Um, do you need any memory change or enhancement to do reduce and those kinds of things? Okay, there there, there were a bunch of questions. So the the first one was uh, streaming. Um, the window, the windows. How do the window definitions work? So the window definitions are actually they're they're very flexible. They're um, they're based on policies. So there there are two policies you define in Flink. One is that says um, like in eviction policies, how long do you keep data when you do you throw it out, and when do you actually trigger a computation over whatever is in your window. So. Um, you, you can define them in, in very flexible ways. You can say trigger them every five minutes of the last hundred elements or so. 
um, what do we do if the window grows so large that it does not fit into memory? That is something where currently we do not do anything. That is a we sort of um, this is still work in progress to enhance this. It is um, yeah, there there are probably two directions into which to go. I mean, one is you can always start spilling. The first one is whether we want to do that. The other one would be state rebalancing. These are things into into which we will yeah we we'll look in the future. It's not in there yet. It was a second question. I have the again. Um, so you know, these are general purpose memories that you are using, right? No new unique algorithms to handle uh, any of the functions that you could do if you wrote specific algorithms uh, that those could do uh, new functions, for instance. Um, you yeah, know, there are processors being defined with new memory algorithms. Do more <coughs> new things that, for which you don't really need a network-wide infrastructure <coughs> to do a lot of things. It's just one. Okay. Oh, so, ah, yeah. uh, my question is: um, Do you need any enhancement to your memory to implement the algorithms that you work? No, so ah, it, okay. it works on the standard. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so, so right now, it, yeah, it is. Uh, it's just. It's implementing the, let's say, the, the well-known database type algorithms on, on standard memory. Um, in order to exploit that, I think we would need an adoption of that memory and of the memory infrastructure, yes. Oh, uh, definitely. One more. Um, since you offer an abstraction over batch and stream processing, uh, it seems uh, to target the same kind of space as uh, the Summingbird project. Um, do you intend Flink to be kind of a better summing verdict, or can you comment on that? Yeah, so no, we, I mean, we're, we're not trying to, to say Flink is a, is a better summing verdict, so um, it's, um, it's just a, sort, of, sort, of, sort of an evolution of a, of a streaming engine that came more from a, from a Stormish perspective. In that sense, it, has, it shares some characteristics there. On top of which we first implemented batch APIs and then and then then stream APIs. Yeah, it shares characteristics, but to be honest, um, I can't I can't tell you too much about something right now. Um, where the where the speed sweet spots are for two systems are. Alright, well thank you very much. Thank you, thanks for coming, thank you.